Professor Pavlina uh, Treneva. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Pavlina. Um, uh, Pavlina is an associate professor of economics at Bard College and a research scholar at the Levy Economics Institute in New York. She specializes in modern monetary theory and public policy. Um, her book, The Case for a Job Guarantee, published in 2020, is the ultimate guide to the benefits of one of the most transformative public policies being discussed today. She has collaborated with policymakers from the U.S. and abroad on designing and evaluating employment programs. Her early work assessed Argentina's adoption of a large-scale job creation proposal she had developed with colleagues in the United States. She also worked with the Sanders 2016 presidential campaign uh, after her research on inequality garnered national attention. Um, thank you so much for being with us, uh, Pavlina, and for sharing your time with us. Um, thank you so much for having me. Good to talk to you. Yeah, and uh, of course, we're going to be talking about the the job guarantee proposal um, and how that could maybe uh, fit in with the solidarity economy and cooperative movements that uh, we're into. Um, and maybe before we get into that, we can just do some brief introductions. My name is Josh Davis. I'm the content manager for grassroots economic organizing um, and speaking to you from the Flathead Indian Reservation, um, home of the Salish, Kootenai and Ponderé tribes in Northwestern Montana. Um, Abe, why don't you give us an intro and yeah. Um, I'm Abe Gresswoods. I'm on uh, Lenape land here in Newark, New Jersey, and I am a co-editor at Geo Collective. And Havlina, if you would like to introduce yourself any more than I already did, you can. Good to talk to you. Uh, my name is Pavlina Cherneva. I teach economics at Bard College. I also direct the Economic Democracy Initiative at the Open Society University Network and conduct research at the Levy Economics Institute. Excellent. Um, yeah, so we we are interested to talk about the job guarantee today and um, just to kind of give our, our uh, viewers uh, who might not be quite familiar with it um, a, a little basic introduction. I uh, just clipped out a little section from uh, one of your Papers, Pavlina, I'll just uh, start us off by reading that, and then we can go from there. Um, the avalanche of job losses today and mass unemployment tomorrow are, are of our own making, created by our seeming inability to conceive of policies that protect and create jobs on demand. There is another option. Instead of capitulating to a world of guaranteed unemployment, we can demand policies that guarantee employment. The government can create jobs directly via mass mobilization and a job guarantee, a program that guarantees anyone who walks into the unemployment office can walk out with an employment option that offers a minimum living income with benefits. The job guarantee is a public option for jobs in the public, public service sector that offers on-the-job training and assistance with transitioning to other employment opportunities. So. That's kind of, you know, maybe just the very skeletal version of it. Uh, what what else would you add to give people an idea, kind of flesh that out, proposal out for us? Yeah, the, the job guarantee is just the uh, straightforward solution to somebody seeking work, decent work with basic uh, income and benefits. Um, and that is the direct approach. If you... Um, are looking, if you're sending resumes, if you're knocking on doors and you're striking out time and time again, um, you can be assured through this policy that uh, there will always be a public option, that the public sector will craft a, um, a program that will be for anyone uh, who uh, wants uh, employment and um, it will be guaranteed at this basic wages and benefits. So what, what it essentially we're proposing is that um, we have a direct solution to unemployment. The quote that you read is in a discussion that related to the COVID crisis. And the question that we faced during COVID is what do we do when we shut down the economy? What do we do when businesses uh, stop operating on large scale, scale that we hadn't seen before? 
And we understand that in moments of crisis, the public sector has to step in and step in boldly. Um, but the way we normally address crisis is just by sort of throwing money at the problem rather than thinking through what are the precise policies and interventions we might need. And one of the first things that we understood, one of the first uh, casualties of COVID would be jobs, people losing jobs, being furloughed, you know, businesses closing down. And there was, you know, such a looming economic insecurity that, that comes uh, with, with this crisis. As we seen in 2008, as we have seen in previous crises, jobs are the, the collateral damage. And so why do we not have a more precisely crafted approach to protecting jobs or creating jobs where they're missing? That's really ultimately the question that, that uh, I was asking. And in the face of COVID, you could look around the world how countries responded in different ways. Uh, some countries simply paid payroll. They just guaranteed the jobs which already existed in the private sector. They said, do not lay off workers. We will cover the wages uh, of threatened workers or of all workers, depending where you look. And those countries that protected jobs didn't see the double digit unemployment rates that we saw in the United States. Countries like Canada and the United States spent proportionately two or three times as much as European countries spend on COVID but did not protect jobs. They provided uh, unemployment, expanded unemployment insurance, additional checks, but they kind of resigned themselves to the idea that, yeah, firms are gonna be laying off workers and we're just gonna you know, do the right thing, make sure people don't starve, but we won't actually protect jobs. And so guaranteeing jobs can take the form of protecting payroll when we are faced with a crisis and when people are going to be laid off. But one thing to really uh, consider is that the amount of money that we spent on the COVID response in that very first year, actually, in fact, in the very first stimulus package, um, was sufficient not only to pay the wages and salaries of the entire economy for three months, but also to employ all of the existing unemployed people at living wages. And so you see, we, it's never really for lack of money that we don't solve our problems. You know, crisis after crisis, we see that, you know, quite quickly, we mobilize our financial uh, resources to respond, whether it is a hurricane, whether it is, you know, natural disaster, financial crisis or COVID, we have the financing, we just don't have the approach. So the job guarantee was uh, the way I tend to think of it is actually as a policy that is permanent. It's not just there for us in the midst of a severe recession. Um, in fact, uh, more beneficial it would be if it were implemented in good times, in relatively prosperous times, because it becomes a structural support to the economy, a policy that will absorb um, any people who might be laid off for whatever reason, and thus stabilize the economy through an employment-led approach. We don't allow unemployment to develop in these kind of you know rapid and drastic kind of ways as we observe it. We simply have an employment safety net, and that fundamentally transforms the economy. It it becomes a more stable economy. People have more stable incomes. They can plan better for themselves and their families. They can patronize their communities. They uh, don't have to face um, and uncertainties and the kind of um, problems that come with the uncertain employment and income um, from health problems to community disrepair to kind of the loss of the social fabric. I mean, employment is essential. And so in a very simple way, um, the job guarantee says, okay, if there are communities that have that lack jobs, we will create them right there and then. I was wondering, um, how do you see the job guarantee as addressing current market failures beyond um, just unemployment? Yes, the, the job guarantee is on the face of it, just an employment program for people who seek work. And I should say that um, 
in its formulation, it is a guarantee to anyone. So in a sense, you don't really have to be unemployed necessarily to be able to access the job. In, in uh, the human rights framework, the right to work or the right to employment, um, you, can, you can see policies who provide direct employment or guarantee employment that are not conditional on unemployment. So one of the thing, one of the biggest, the biggest program of job guarantee program in the world is in India, and it guarantees 100 days of rural employment that's not conditional on unemployment. So that's that's number one. The first thing that the job guarantee could potentially assure is the right to employment to all. But it, in a market economy, it does address a, a whole set of problems that emerge from the way the economy functions. Um, and the first one would be it would fix or it would um, fortify the way the labor market works. So currently, the labor market is not a fair game. It doesn't work very equitably. If you if you consider the question, who gets jobs? It's actually usually people who already have jobs. Like those who are able to jump from employment opportunity to another are the ones who have been employed and they have robust resumes. But if you've been unemployed for some time, the barriers to employment are significant. And they are not just the gap in the resume, but that's significant. So if an employer is looking at various candidates, those who have had kind of spotty work experience, uh, uh, they have been out of the labor market for a while, they, they are the last to, to get called. And we see this in the data, caregivers, their uh, you know, unemployment rates are the last ones to recover. Uh, people with disabilities, uh, people who do low wage work, um, they are, I mean, the, the labor market works in the way that they, they, you know, they just throws them out of the out of jobs and then rehires them in and out and in and out. That is extremely unstable and precarious uh, employment scenario. And so people don't even have the chance to build uh, employment uh, experience, tenure, you know, build, uh, you know, increase their incomes. So one one of, the, one of the things that the job guarantee will remedy, it will provide stable employment opportunity for people who have the most precarious employment life um, and, and those who, who cannot even find a job. So you see the, the national, the, the official numbers of unemployment, they don't even tell us the whole story. Um, it's a very narrow definition of who's unemployed. Uh, we we know and we understand that uh, there are many people who are looking, who would like to have work, but they might not be looking um, during the survey week. And so the Bureau of Labor Statistics tries to calculate a more expanded definition. But uh, even that doesn't include uh, everyone. The research of Kyle Moore, uh, research assistant at the Economic Democracy Initiative, um, shows that on any given day, about 30% of the um, prime working age uh, people can, are looking and ready to take a job if one were available. Okay, so normally the unemployment rate hovers between 3.5% to, you know, as high as, uh, you know, 14% during the pandemic. But even when we look at expanded definitions, today the official unemployment rate um, is about half as what as, as what it would otherwise be. But if you look at people who are outside of the labor market and are not captured even by the expanded definition of unemployment, far more would take an, a job if one were available immediately. So the job guarantee will address this hidden unemployment, um, this kind of pent up demand in employment. You know, a lot of times we say caregivers, they don't really want jobs because they're taking care of elderly, of young people. But actually, uh, it is really because the employment opportunities are not there to allow them to both take care of the people they have to take care of and to support themselves. And so the choice is not really a genuine choice. Um, uh, if we have employment guarantee, then we will know who for sure is involuntarily employed and who um, uh, is not uh, ready or interested in taking advantage of the employment opportunities. Another labor market failure uh, that the job guarantee would address is, is the problem with wages, um, firming up the wage floor. So today we talk about minimum wage policies, which are very important to 
provide, you know, at least some basic decent income. Our minimum wage policy in the United States doesn't provide living income. Uh, you know, seven dollars and twenty-five cents um, is the minimum wage that hasn't changed since two thousand and nine. And we are, you know, we are now 13 years later. Um, it's pitifully low. But if you can't find a minimum wage job and you want to work, your effective wage is zero. So the minimum wage doesn't really support uh, the labor market as it should. And for that, we need to have a full employment policy. We need to also have the guarantee that a person would find that employment opportunities. Now, when I uh, wrote the book, um, that was, you know, two and a half years ago. And even earlier, we would propose $15 an hour in order to help the state-led movement for a $15 an hour wage. As you know, there are living wage ordinances uh, across the country that are trying, that are aiming higher than the, than the minimum wage. But even that wage is too low today. It's not, even 15 is not enough. And so a job guarantee at $20 an hour, it will, will make a world of difference for an enormous proportion of the population, not just those who don't have the job, but those who have a job. Because if there's a public option for 20, your employer has to match that public option in order to keep you on the job. And so there is a, that other added benefit of raising the floor by establishing a genuine minimum wage and by incentivizing private firms to match that floor. What about benefits? It's the same situation. You know, we want to have universal health care. We want to have social security. It, you know, social security is a pretty good, robust program, but there are still about 4% of people who are working who don't have access to social security. They don't accumulate enough hours to qualify um, for social security. And perhaps it's because of the inability to, to find employment. With the job guarantee, we will provide those missing opportunities. Uh, what if the job guarantee provided health care as part of the package? In the same way, an employer will have to match the benefits of a job guarantee to remain, so to speak, competitive. And so there is another, like a quick way of formalizing some of these um, you know, benefits throughout the market when we establish the standard for wages and benefits. And I think the last one that I will emphasize is that you know, the job guarantee is a public employment program. And so typically public employment programs do um, kind of activities for the public good, for public service. And we can recognize care work that is not adequately remunerated. We can recognize volunteer work that is absolutely essential, but it's not paid. The job guarantee can create projects um, that deal with um, environmental concerns that are not adequately addressed by private sector activities. So in other words, we, we have um, the possibility to uh, support essential work that uh, is not uh, adequately supplied, adequately provided on the local level um, and supported with decent wages. Yeah. And um, while I'm listening to you there, I, uh, a couple of other um, big ones pop, to, pop into my head that um, a lot of people in GEO are very concerned with, specifically uh, the problems faced by returning citizens from our quote unquote justice system. Um, you know, it's very difficult to, to land a job if you uh, were incarcerated um, ever or and definitely in the, in the recent future. So, you know, having a, a guarantee. And I know um, a lot of places, even just down the road in Missoula, Montana, which is not like a massive urban center by any means, there's a lot of homelessness and it's only been getting worse year by year. Um, and, you know, a lot of that starts with a, a job loss. Um, so yeah, it's, the benefits are great. Um, and so can you talk a little bit, um, because, you know, we're talking about this in kind of very kind of, uh, somewhat high level terms, I suppose, um, in terms of like the more kind of, uh, nuts and bolts of it, you have in your, uh, 
version of this proposal, um, it's not necessarily local or state governments or the federal government administering the program uh, on the ground level, but um, you envision roles for social enterprises and co-ops and um, and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about you know, kind of what your thoughts are and maybe where those kind of organizations might fit into such a program? Yes, uh, happily. This is this really addresses the question of how do you do it? Um, if there, there are many different models of direct job creation and uh, you know, public employment programs. And as I mentioned, we typically tend to see them in moments of crisis, the Great Depression, right? You know, we, we had the New Deal and that created a projects in every county in the country. And you know, a lot of these were federal projects. And you know the government went in and you know said we're going to electrify Tennessee and that's what we did and we're going to build the roads and that's what we did and we're going to build um, hiking trails and parks and those were large scale federal projects. We have seen that happen uh, in other uh, countries as well, but there is also you know many 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 examples of um, programs that are organized from the ground up from the bottom up, where the public sector provides the funding, they provide the guidelines, the general parameters of the kind of work that will qualify for the program. But in the end, it allows communities to self-organize and propose those projects and um, uh, basically petition the public sector for funds. I find this to be very compelling. This is a kind of a participatory approach um, that first, seems to be better targeted because folks on the ground know what their communities need. And, you know, just going back to, you know, the example of volunteer work. I mean, we, we rely so much on volunteers for some basic, you know, basic functions in our communities, you know, to have some after school activities for kids, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, outreach programs for veterans, for the elderly, you know, like people self-organize, they know their environmental projects. But now imagine that this is structured and supported in a much more, you know, kind of stable way through wages, through some funds for materials um, and various other wraparound services transportation. So if we do it from the ground up, again, there are various ways in which this can be done. Suddenly the municipalities and the localities can be involved um, in some local projects, small infrastructure projects, maybe the school sidewalks need to be repaired, maybe proper signage needs to be installed, etc. all useful things. But to be able to have in every corner of the country a project, I think we need to rely on the solidarity networks and allow different community groups to participate actively um, with, with their ideas. So as you mentioned in the introduction, I studied the program in Argentina and that was again, a very large program. It employed about 13% of the labor force in the depths of the Argentinian crisis. Uh, and when, when we visited a lot of the projects, we found that they were not only self-organized, but they were organized on cooperative basis, where people used the funds that the government provided for wages and materials, and then they set up shop. You know, they set up little tiny, um, you know, tailoring uh, shops, you know, toy making um, kind of ventures. They had, a, you know, a little... Um, micro enterprise, if you will, that did school uniforms. Um, and then they would sell some of the output on, on the market and then they'll share uh, the proceeds among themselves. They will allocate some, they'll save some to reinvest. And so the way I thought of it was as an alternative to uh, micro credit. You know, uh, you know the the microcredit uh, model of development is you provide a micro loan, then the loan gets repaid. You provide another loan, gets repaid. But actually, this is a micro grant. You know, you're really investing in that community, and you're saying, okay, here I'm going to give you the tools, I'm going to give you the seed funding, and support you for the first few years. And I and and that's essentially what happened in Argentina because the the program was phased out. You know, and then what do you have left afterwards? Well. 
you already have some community groups that have been able to organize and potentially, you know, have their uh, kind of means to support themselves after the program is phased out. Um, the program that I mentioned was the largest one in the world, the one in India that organizes a rural project that guarantees rural employment is almost entirely self-organized by the villages. And the Ministry of Agriculture, for example, set some guidelines about, um, you know, providing water irrigation systems, dealing with wells, with soil erosion. But then the village gets together uh, in the Grand Pachayat is what they're called. They get together, they hash it out, they talk about how many people need to be employed in this community, what they need to do, some road work or whatever. And then they propose the project and they uh, get, uh, get the funding. And so in, in a certain way, at least in the law, the public sector can't really overrule some of these proposals. At least that's what the intention is. You know, there's, there, there are some issues with implementation, but I think the design is very um, interesting. It's kind of significant. It fosters participatory design from the ground up. And it seems to become have become a leading program for dealing with water conservation and um, uh, water irrigation uh, problems. So in the, what would it look like in the United States? Um, you know, what if in every, in every county, uh, we used what are called the existing employment offices, American job centers? What if these became job banks? What if our communities you know, went and proposed projects and their lists that would be listed in these jobs banks on the website or, you know, in the actual office <laughs> to the extent that there's office. And community said, look, we need people for, we're doing species monitoring here on the Hudson River. You know, we need a lot of people. We need people to do, you know, uh, planting of trees or, you know, removal of invasive species. Um, and we list, we need childcare, you know, and different communities have different needs. You know, some might have, you know, a greater proportion of folks with disability, maybe people who with elderly, maybe there are there's a community where there are a lot of former inmates and there are different outreach programs. And so if we had these lists, then that would be the kind of uh, bottom up project design that would be um, implemented through nonprofits, community groups, cooperatives um, and uh, various various um, uh, organizations. I would say that, you know, this is public good. This is public money for the public service. So, it, you know, for-profit companies, you know, wouldn't be the candidate um, for project proposals because we don't want to, you know, replace what they would be hiring anyway, the people they will be hiring anyway, with some sort of subsidized employment. We really want to support the kind of activity that private firms aren't doing. But I can envision, you know, a scenario where, yeah, some young people can get apprenticeships in, you know, and in, in local companies um, just to get, you know, get going and get some credentialing. So, uh, you know, that that would be another um, kind of opportunity. I also think of um, the economic pressures that are, um, many families face from you know, from loss of a member of the family from through incarceration, through um, the pressure of spouses to stay in a unhealthy um, relationship because of economic, you know, basically entrapment. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of scenarios I can imagine um, this giving a, um, a way out for people, you know. Yeah. And, and back to your, your question about market failures. I mean, I almost yeah. I almost don't even use the word market failures. It's just the market works this way because we have unemployment and the ability of an employer to harass their employees um, uh, in large part depends uh, on the fact that the employees don't have another choice. They don't have a, a, an option to walk away. And so a lot of these you know, perverse dynamics are actually very much natural to, the, to a market that doesn't create enough economic security through decent, um, decent employment. And you know, just to go back to our question of, uh, of, uh, of funding, you know, the United States, we, you know, we incarcerate such a large proportion of our population and you know, our incarceration 
can vary. You know, I think the national average is around $35,000, but in the state of New York, it could be around $100,000 a person per year. Think of how many living wage jobs that is, right? So we, it, is, it is not for lack of resources or funding that we can't you know, support people who experience economic insecurity. When uh, folks are released from prison, very often they reoffend for, for lack of you know, finding, a, again, another employment opportunity. And projects that deal with employing former inmates have far lower recidivism rates. So that's just one example. But I, I think you know, a, a person who is, like you said, in an abusive relationship, whether it is employer, employee, or spouses, mm -hmm be able to walk away because they have a means of, of providing for themselves is truly is, is essential. And it puts that pressure on the private sector to, to do what the what this job guarantee is doing for communities as well, right? Like if, if what just wage wise and in terms of social responsibility, right? It's kind of um, asking the private sector to step it up a little bit. Yeah, I, without a doubt, with respect to how they treat their workers, that right now they don't really have this pressure and incentive, you know, to to do the right thing. You know, we we see problems with wage theft. Uh, you know, they know that their the workers don't have another opportunity. Um, you know, working conditions, uh, a fully employed economy where people have choices operates in a very, very different way. And companies then have to, um, you know, cater to them a little bit, uh, a little bit more. We, we see this now in a, in a sense, um, after the, the pandemic, and there are sectors in the economy where there are shortages. And we do see that wages are increasing there. And, you know, the, the workers are eking out <laughs> little benefits. Um, you know, I don't want to oversell this, but you know, we do we do see that that happens when you have you know very low unemployment rates. Now there are other large swaths of the population that are just not benefiting from the wage increases, uh, you know, nearly sufficiently, or um, you know, uh, you know, kind of the, the stable employment opportunities. You know, mass layoffs are still a, a tool that companies will use. As, as soon as they see their profits decline. And when we see mass layoffs, we know what happens. They spread like avalanche uh, through these communities because people lose their incomes. They have temporary unemployment insurance. Some don't even have that. And then we see that uh, you know they curb their spending considerably and then others lose their jobs without any you know without them experiencing mass layoffs it's just business is not there so it's just a plague it's truly uh kind of a very um a, like i i uh, describe it as akin to a disease you know and so we want to uh we want to really tackle the problem at the heart geographically when we look at the united states there are communities that have 30 to 40 percent or even higher reservations you know even higher unemployment rates on a good day. We don't see the national statistics. We don't, we don't see it. Coastal communities, uh, Ross Belt, we, and we kind of accept this as normal. From a policy standpoint, that's considered to be normal. I, you know, economists call this structural unemployment. There's nothing normal about this. It has caused the deaths of despair. It has caused the epidemic, the, you know, the opioid epidemic. It has contributed to so much um, kind of social disintegration, if you will. And we have choices. We can go into those communities and provide people with alternative, meaningful employment opportunities. Yeah, another so, aspect I just wanted to maybe uh, highlight that's in with specifically for people who are interested in worker co ops, which is a lot of our audience. Um, like a benefit to this from having, you know, worked with people doing, you know, setting up worker co-ops, it was like any small business, you have to volunteer, basically, you're going to be working for free for the first year or so, right? It's um, most businesses don't immediately turn a profit. And that's a huge, you know, risk for a lot of people, especially, you know, those of us who are more low income to, you know, try to keep our job that we have and then be doing this other one or maybe take the risk on quitting the job so we can try to focus on the co-op. If you have a job guarantee where you know like, okay, we can try to do this thing. If it doesn't work out, we all have a fallback 
you know, it, it, that I think would be um, for co-op development, um, like a huge uh, bonus, like it might not be obvious, but that would be like a, a major side benefit in the same way that, you know, Abe was talking about, um, you know, people stuck in bad relationships and not wanting to leave for economic reasons. Um, yeah, same kind of thing. So I think there's I mean, all sorts of benefits. I would say that the job guarantee, you know, could uh, just directly support whatever cooperative, you know, activity that you're, you're undertaking right now and, and basically socialize those risks. Mm. Um, not, not, not necessarily as a fallback. It could be a fallback if it doesn't work out, you know, you know, maybe you're doing a community co-op that's doing with elderly care. And, and, and if it doesn't work out, you know, you, you can, you know, you can fall back on some other job in the community, but why not make that part of the job guarantee? Like that kind of bottom-up proposal and design, um, would, you know, would, would permit that. And, and I think that, cooperatives are you know they they kind of democratize work in many more ways than one right it's you the relationship among people who are working is very different than the employer employee relationship um the decision making power that you know the, the, you know who the stakeholders are uh, i that is um kind of uh what we found and was a bit surprising to us when we we saw you know the projects in argentina and they they were transformative. We went to one community, which was um, called uh, the Hidden City, uh, you know, because they just they were so poor, and they believe the government just forgotten about them. And we we went and we saw them do family attention centers. They did community kitchens. They did little community gardens. Lots of things. And and then a couple of years later. Uh, graduate students visited that same community that now benefited from the job guarantee and they had changed their name. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's quite something not to think anymore that you're a hidden city. So in making this um, job guarantee a reality, reality um, do you have thoughts or ideas on creating the political will or pressure to make such a policy um, go through Congress? Well, um, it is the million dollar question, Abe, for sure. How do these programs become a reality? I mean, I think ultimately it's pressure from below. Um, I think enough people need to want it and demand it. Um, in the case of Argentina, people just took to the streets and they they banged the pots and pans and they said jobs, 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 jobs. And, and that, that the government heard their call. And uh, previously, there was an economist at the labor ministry who was trying to push this program for a number of years and was not successful until people went out and they asked for it. Um, I think the Indian experience is, is somewhat similar, including some sort of backstage negotiation among parties on how to deal with some of the, you know, rural mass poverty and, and riots, really. Um, in Europe, we do see programs that are smaller and are very interesting in their, their design, and they are once again uh, started from the ground as pilots. There is a project in France called the Zero Long-Term Unemployment Areas. And really it's, it's a group like a social enterprise. It's a nonprofit organization that was self-formed by citizens and they created these projects. Um, and they had to go from mayor to mayor to convince them that uh, you know, they should create these you know, uh, direct employment programs for the long-term unemployed. And then it turned out that it paid off that for mayors understood the benefits, you know, it cost, it caused a bunch of cost savings on some of the anti-poverty programs and others. And that eventually went to parliament and then parliament authorized the bigger budget to expand the program. So there are, I mean, I think, you know, talking to policymakers and understanding that this is an approach that's for the taking, there for the taking. It's not like we haven't done it before. Um, we we have had experience and maybe we need to return a little bit more to these direct approaches rather than nudges, incentives, tax credits, and, and the whole complex web of policies that actually don't create jobs. 
So I would say, you know, any and every strategy <laughs> that, that works, but definitely um, not kind of uh, mainstreaming the idea is step number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mainstreaming the idea, and I think getting it um, kind of through everybody's heads, um, which seems to be happening maybe a little bit more now, that um, it's not, we don't need to worry about indebting our grandchildren through the federal budget deficit, you know, or the or, 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 or the federal debt, right? I mean, for any social program spending, this is always the uh, the refrain that we hear, how are we going to pay for it? And of course, like, we don't ask that question when it comes to military spending or anything like that. Um, but as you just pointed out, like in Europe, if they're doing something similar in Europe, if they're able to do, uh, you know, these uh, sorts of programs in Europe where they don't have the fiscal policy space, right? Because the European Central Bank is in control of their, um, you know, the uh, monetary policy for all of the countries. Like we have so much more space here in the U.S. So if, I mean, if they could do it over there, it seems like a no-brainer that we should be able to do it, and that it might actually. I mean, um, not well. I don't want to. I don't want to go there. But it seems that you seem to be implying that there's so much cost savings that even on a local level that a, a government that does not have its own currency creating power can nonetheless fund a program that, that does some kind of job guarantee. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the very first thing is just to recognize that we have no trouble like mobilizing enormous budgets on short order for whatever crisis we face. Like if we just look at the numbers, I think that that it takes away this idea that the government doesn't have the money. Um, and back in 2008, uh, you know, I, I was looking at the budget that was appropriated through the Recovery Act. And that budget was enough to create 20 million living wage jobs with that budget. We didn't have to create 20 million. We just needed to create five because then the economy just picks up and makes up the difference. And we barely eked out a million or two million created or saved jobs by the official government estimates. Very low bang for the buck. If we had had the direct approach, uh, the job would have been done much faster. We didn't have to slog through the longest jobless recovery. The, as I said, the COVID calculations are very clear. We could have paid every single wage for every single person in the entire economy for three months plus employ the unemployed. There are lots of cost uh, estimates on unemployment. And it turns out, and all these, uh, these experiences that I'm, I'm sharing, um, including a pilot, a job guarantee pilot in Austria, as well as the French experiment, that the costs uh, associated with unemployment, just the monetary costs, are about uh, equal to what the living, the wage that is being paid through the program. Um, and so that's the, the immediate cost. But as we know, unemployment has a lot of non-pecuniary costs, all of the stuff that we discussed. And it's, they're not just scarring effects for the person who's unemployed. You know, the kids are doing worse in schools. They're malnourished. You know, there's no roof over the head. The family is distressed. Health problems, you know, are a little harder to quantify. So the whole, the, the, actually those are far greater than the monetary cost. So if we are able to, to um, recognize that we are already paying these costs, and then indeed the job guarantee is really a cost-saving device, democracy-saving device, um, it has all of these other positive social benefits. I think the money question really should, should not be front and center. Yes. Definitely agreed on that. Um, unfortunately, it's something that always comes up. Um, uh, one of the reasons why I did an economics degree was because every time I'd have a political conversation with somebody who didn't agree with me, they tell me, well, you just don't understand the economics of it. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, that's... Um, it would help if people um, uh, understood that, you know, there are, uh, the public sector is not the same thing as a household sector. Yes. And the way the public sector spends and pays its bills is, is very different from how you and I do it. And, you know, they are institutions we have designed precisely for the purpose to allow the public uh, sector to face challenges uh, without without the money question being a, being an issue. And so uh, 
that is always used to divert us from talking about the real issues, which is like, how do we tackle economic insecurity? How do we provide jobs? How do we deal with environmental problems? Um, so the money question is a bit of a, it, you know, it's like it's it's the guardian at the gates that says, no, no, you can walk through. You can think about addressing uh, important questions because some myth that we don't have money. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, one thing I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, we, we were talking about uh, involving co-ops in the program and, you know, having, you know, why wouldn't we just have the maybe the job guarantee program directly, uh, you know, fund some cooperative things, just the um, I, I'll add, I'll just throw in that one of the concerns that a lot of cooperators have is that um, in several countries in South America and in the UK, for instance, um, have had pretty not great experiences uh, with co-ops being created through government funding, like that too much, you know, hand holding and and and, and help, um, you know, doesn't create strong uh, strong enterprises, and that when the the funding goes away that a lot of times those co-ops you know don't stick around very long i know like in venezuela that was an issue and then like i said in the uk they've had that experience i think back in the 70s um and so i think a lot of people might be a little bit reticent to have like direct uh federal funding um going to co-ops but um i don't you know it's it's certainly like that's the kind of debate I would rather be having, <laughs> you know, about it, it, it um, than the, you know, kind of ones we have now about how to pay for it and all that stuff. So, well, maybe I should say that, uh, you know, one of the main features of the job guarantee is that it is a voluntary program. This is, this is not a program where the public sector requires somebody to work for benefits, takes away benefits unless they work. This is just an additional program. And the way we tend to think of it is as a demand driven program. If the co-op doesn't want to apply for it and does not want to propose the project through, through the job guarantee, then they don't have to do this. If somebody doesn't wish to take to take a job in the community in an environmental project or whatever the community is designed, then they don't have to do this. Um, and maybe that a little bit would address the issue rather than you know establishing criteria and saying these must be cooperative you know projects and then mm. whoever proposes then has to be thinking through you know how, how do I do that right part part of the issue with some of those projects too is a matter of um, edu um the um side of education of, um, for our workers <laughs> do you um do you think that there's a place in the job guarantee for education for social entrepreneurs, you know? Without a doubt, and, and I want to preface, the job guarantee is really not a panacea for so many problems that we have in our economy and in the labor market. It, it's just that it is it's such a direct solution that it does help tackle a whole host of issues, but by no means is going to solve them. And so what I normally say is that we focus on education correctly, but we don't provide the guarantee that that education is going to translate into something. So we train people for jobs that are not there. So why not create a, a, you know, a, the missing jobs? And then if uh, young people want to get trained through the program to install solar panels or you know just do uh, some infrastructure work or you know, some sort of vocational skills, I think that's a good site for, for doing that. If we want to have teacher assistants that shadow teachers and help alleviate the crowded classroom problem and then get that on the job training, that, that's, that sounds like a, a good site, a good place to do it. Right now we train them to be teachers and then they don't get hired. And so we could, we could create um, uh, the jobs and provide that as a, a, as a, you know, make it serve as a stepping stone to other employment opportunities. All right. Um, well, I think we're probably getting towards the end of our time here. Um, thanks so much, uh, for, for, for talking with us, Pavlina and, um, yeah, it's been great. And I, I hope that, you know, this, uh, this policy proposal, uh, you know, goes somewhere and if there's, you know, anything that, um, any bills or anything that needs support or that, um, you know, I, we're definitely would love to know about it to help support those. So I don't know if there's any bills in Congress now um, 
or or if we're expecting any but um yeah there there i mean the job guarantee is at least articulated as a as a key statement in the green new deal resolution um there are some draft resolutions there's a job guarantee um grant making bill uh that's in the it's uh you know it's it's being worked on by um representative um Bonnie uh Coleman uh, Watson Coleman uh, from New Jersey there is um there is a job guarantee resolution by Ayanna Presley and has not been translated into a bill um there was a you know they have been there is HR 1000 which is um a, an older bill that is being re you know uh, re not reauthorized but um uh, it's um renamed it and running it through the process again <laughs> exactly it, you know it gets renewed basically so it's not for you know it's not that we don't have uh some sort of frameworks for thinking i think you know the ccc which was you know part of the climate conservation core of biden's program you know that's that's a framework that one could work with but it was just it, it didn't really make it into the IRA, and very little money was even entertained, you know, in the in the initial stages. But we we have ways of thinking about this, and so hopefully at some point these are all going to converge. So I, you know, I thank you also for for giving me a chance to talk to your um, to your community, and certainly you know spread the word, and uh, you know we we uh, keep chugging along, and uh, sometimes policy surprises us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if all else fails, it sounds like pots and pans out in the street and just chant jobs, jobs, jobs until they listen, right? <laughs> jobs, jobs, jobs. Yes. All right. Great. Great. Best of luck with your work. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.